Good morning. Today is the first day in a while that we have some people back here. So welcome to all of you and welcome to all of you out there on live stream. It's always good to have you with us from wherever you are. It is a beautiful, sunny, crisp day here in Quakertown and we're just delighted to be able to worship the Lord. So we are back today with three of our four services. Uh, eight o'clock, we have the ability to have up to 25 in our sanctuary. Nine o'clock, we're continuing to be out there in the parking lot. You can just drive in and, and join us if you wish. 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary, also on live stream, we'll be here once again. So the Lord is good, and we are so grateful to be again at a percentage in our area where we can enjoy worship together. And we're looking forward to a new time. Vaccines are coming, and it's getting better and better. And so we have gotten through a difficult year, and the Lord is bringing us into a new place. I want to remind you tomorrow night, if you are interested in our dream tank, we have dream tank and it's a gathering in which we dream forward creatively as the church. That will be tomorrow night at seven. A link will go out tomorrow. You should get that from Barb. If you are not on our mailing list and want to be, make sure that you contact Barb at B-A-R-B -B at Q-U-M-C dot com and she will make sure to get you on the mailing list for our events, for our studies, and also for our worship schedule and bulletin. Also, in February 1st, Monday night at 7, we continue with our Bible study, Scandalous. Even though we will be in our third week, you can jump in at any time. It's a different study, technically, each week. So come and join us. We have a lot of fun. We continue today with another special announcement also from our SPRC. So I'm going to invite up Bill Scott, our, our president, our um, chair of SPRC, to make an announcement to you about our church. Good morning. Um, back in, I think it was November, December? Okay. Sometime in that area, uh, I, I announced that uh, Lori was, because of family reasons, going to be leaving uh, us. Uh, and we were be getting a new pastor. I am here to announce, to make this happen. Because of logistical reasons, all the people out there in internet land and here in the sanctuary, we were the first people to know this other than me, okay? So um, I am pleased to announce that we have been assigned our new pastor. It is Rick Brown. Rick, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting with him for a short time the other day. Him and his wife um, have a two-year-old daughter. Um, they're both young in my world. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it is, I'm looking forward to uh, Rick joining us in what will be July by the time this all goes on, but um, there'll be a, more of an announcement and things about Rick and what we're going to do to meet and greet Rick and his family uh, as they move here to Quaker Town over the next couple months, but there will be an announcement going out the home, so everybody knows this great news. Um, there'll be an announcement going out tomorrow over the internet and we'll be sending a letter out to all the families, but uh, we look forward to Rick joining us and Lori, hopefully you uh, have great success wherever you land on your feet. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, by the way, good morning, everybody. And you know, this is what I still look like. So. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. A time of joy. And um, I know that our guests took great care and doing this and you are one of the first if not the first to get a pastor in this season so 
feel loved and feel cared for. Um, I think that you are, and I'm excited um, about this. Uh, I think that it's been wonderful news. And thank you, Bill, for sharing that. Now, if you have downloaded your bulletin, we are going to continue with worship with our invitation. Lord Jesus, we open our hearts and minds to you this morning and pray that you refresh us and restore us to our mission as your disciples and apostles. Praise the God of restoration, salvation, and resurrection. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord and Savior, as your community of faith, we know we have a mission to fulfill. Grant us the courage, strength, and perseverance to help those in need, feed the hungry, comfort the sick and dying, and bring hope to the lost. Bless our ministry in this church and fill our hearts with zeal for your mission and love for your people. Amen. Now listen, those of you who are here and those of you at home, I hope you'll join in for what is one of my favorite hymns, Lord, You Come to the Lake Shore. us to do. 
So in this time of silent confession today, let us lay those fears in front of the Lord at his feet and ask him not just to forgive us, but to strengthen us and give us the courage to be the kind of apostles he calls us to be. Lord, forgive the times when we have been so afraid it has distracted us from your mission. Forgive us for the times when we have allowed fear to paralyze us and prevent us from hearing your call and answering your call. Forgive us for those times when we have allowed our fears to deter us in helping and healing the people of our world, in partnering with them, and in showing them that you care. Strengthen us now. Lift us into a new place, not just of hope, but of courage to be the people of God that you truly want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And now hear the good news. Jesus knows how hard it is to do the work of the gospel in an ever-changing world, and yet the needs are many. As often as we fail, Often as we falter, Jesus will lift us up and send us out, for he forgives the sinner, strengthens the weak of heart, empowers the unsure, and readies his disciples. In him we can be confident of our mission and assured of our salvation. Amen. And now in the name of those apostles who have founded our church, join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, all you kids out there, I hope that you are gathered around your living room or your kitchen table or wherever you are with your family. We have a message just for you. Good crispy morning, children. Do you still have your very first pair of shoes? Getting your first pair of shoes is a big deal, and it is even a bigger deal when you learn about what goes into getting any kind of shoe, or for that matter, anything we use at home to make life comfortable. However, if you are afraid of people who are different from you, and you don't want to have anything to do with them, you wouldn't have any shoes. Almost everything we use in our homes was made by someone other than a family member because it is so easy to go to the store and buy whatever we need. We may grow some vegetables in a home garden, but not enough of what we use. 
all kinds of things are shipped in from other countries by people we have never heard of. Look at the labels on the things you own. Some may say made in China, produce of Brazil, product of, followed by the names of places you might not have heard of before. We buy and trade things from all over the world, made or grown by people who don't speak our language and may not even look like us. Parts used in our iPhones, washing machines, furniture, cars, and just about everything we own was touched by a foreigner's hand. Even things made in America may be made by a foreigner in an American factory. People learned early in history being afraid of other people who were different from them didn't work very well. The desirable products made in other countries were worth trading and getting over the fears. This made it possible for countries to learn from each other and grow. Trade routes carry all kinds of goods from one country to another were established hundreds of years before Jesus was born. One well-traveled trade route was called the Silk Road. It wasn't made of silk, but it was the main road used by merchants carrying large bolts of silk from China to the Mediterranean for trade or shipping to many other parts of the known world. Buying, selling, and trading may have been around since Adam and Eve had children. We don't need to be afraid of people different from ourselves. Listen to this. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 and verse 13 from the Old Testament tells us, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of righteousness, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. God wanting us to love each other has its purpose. He knew we would sometimes be around people who don't follow him, but because we do trust in him, he promises to always be with us, protecting us and keeping us safe. God is our safety net. When we are at home, go out into the neighborhood, or out into the world, don't forget that. By loving God, we can safely be friends with people from all over the world. After all, we are the foreigners to them. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving me and always being with me, even when I think I am not good. Amen. Children, see you next week. Kids, we miss you. But we're so glad that you're tuning in with us each week. Thanks for doing that. For all of you out there and those of you here, it's time to celebrate our offerings. And you know, I want to thank you for being so faithful this past year. Those of you who have continued to generously give, it's enabled our church to keep doing ministries and the missions of God in new and creative and wonderful ways. And I invite you to keep giving generously as we head now into 2021 and to a new place where we can truly celebrate what God has brought us through. Your gifts help people in this community who are in dire need, who are in need of seeing who God is and knowing that Jesus is in their lives, giving them hope each and every day. Those of you who give online, just go to qumc.com. Those of you that send in checks, 1875 Friar Road in Quakertown, 
Those of you present today will drop your offerings in the basket by the exit door. But right now, wherever you are, just hold your offering in your hand. And let's ask God to bless these gifts. Lord God, healer of many people, we know that your healing power is in this world. And despite our discouragement at times, we know that you are there and we are just filled with your hope and grace today. We offer up now our means that not only by our prayers, but by our tangible gifts, people might know that you are real and that you are present and ready to pull them out of those dark places and into your place of light. We thank you. God bless all of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, that the power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, Lord, for you repay all according to your word. As you come in now to a time of silent prayer, let us pray that we put our hope in God, that we rest our souls in him who can always redeem us from every trouble. Let's pray. Lord, there are so many of your people who feel their lives are in danger or slipping away, that their faith is unsteady, that their hope is lost. Lift them up, Lord, and remind them that you are there. Keep them safe from harm, and let them see the glory of your face. Lord, you are our rock and salvation. We cannot succeed in life on our own, and we find 
can far to be the kind of community you desire us to be. But breathe your holy breath upon us, God. Deliver us from that which distracts and tempts us away from your call. Restore our weakened faith. For you are our solace, our strength, and our hope for a renewed and faith-filled world. Amen. And now as we celebrate our call of God, let us hear and sing together, Jesus Calls Us. All of you probably have an image in your mind of a fisherman. 
but not just any fishermen. I want you to imagine for a minute what those fishermen disciples might have looked like. Usually we imagine them something like the artwork that we see, right, from that time, in which they're kind of hanging around with Jesus with their long robes on and, you know, looking pretty cool sitting out there in the boat. But it's a little bit of a deceptive picture of what being a fisherman was really like. And so we're going to think about that a little more today. In the Quaker town, our town, if those of you who move through Main Street and past Quaker Town Fire Department, there's a sign out there on their lawn that I just love. And those of you probably know what I mean. It's an ad for a volunteer fireman. And it says, Fireman Wanted. And then it says, Cool Hat, Sweet Ride, low pay or no pay, long hours. And you kind of think, wow, <laughs> interesting ad. It's catchy, it's funny, and it really is true. But you know what? Those firemen loved what they do. Every fireman I have known, and I've known several, love being part of that fire community, that fire department group of men and women who hang with each other, who uplift each other, who develop a friendship with each other, and more than that, are bonded by a purpose. Because they believe that their lives are dedicated to making the world and their community a little bit better place. They have the ability to help in ways that no other people do. They rescue people. They help people. And that gives them in their lives an extra meaning. It binds them together in a way that's strong. It's a brotherhood, a sisterhood. That's unique to them. But what's not mentioned in that ad is that there's another side. It's not just, you know, the coolness of being a fireman, although there's a cool aspect. I think every little guy or every little girl grows up thinking, I'm gonna ride on that fire truck, that's so cool, or wear that cool outfit, or handle that fire hose. But there's also a dangerous aspect, because after all, they fight fire. But you know, not one of those people would ever say, that they regret doing what they do. Because the benefits of that purpose and that mission far outweigh the dangers in their lives. And most of them stay in as part of that group for a lifetime. Being a fisherman is a lot the same and being a disciple. In fact, being a fisherman might have had maybe a similar ad. If you think that maybe Jesus today would put out an ad, it might have said something like, beautiful sunrise, fresh salty air, but long hours, hard work, little yield. Because that's what it was like to be a fisherman in that time. You see, when we think of fishing, we think of the rod, you know, we're casting a rod for one fish at a time, but that's not the way it worked out there in Capernaum on the Lake of Galilee. The fishing industry had just taken off. Remember, Rome had built all those new roads, so Capernaum and that whole area of ports around the Sea of Galilee had become a cosmopolitan area. It was new. People were coming through, foreigners of all kinds. It was an eclectic place, and it was a place that was ripe for new industry. And the newest industry was in fishing. In fact, Magdala nearby was a fishing, salting 
town. That's where they salted fish for preserving them. In Greek, in fact, the name for Mambilla means a fish salting town. And so that's what they were known for in that area. Fishing was taking off as an industry. But it wasn't an easy industry, and much like some of the industries we're familiar with today, it was hard, hard work. It was work that you had to do from morning till night every single day. It was done by netting. The fishing industry then had three kinds of nets, but two of them were used the most. One was a circular net, and these nets were made of linen, which was very popular fabric then, thick, thick netting. And they would make kind of a circular round net that they could cast off the side of a boat. And then they would pull, they would sweep the water and pull in as many fish as they could. So they kind of boat for places that they thought that schools of fish would be at certain times. And they got to kind of know that and have an intuition for that. And they'd see what they could catch and pull into the boat. Now these couldn't be too big because after all, you didn't want to capsize your boat. But then there was another type of fishing. And this type used a send net. And a send net is what we call today a drag net. It was huge, a big, big, solid, heavy net. And it required a whole group of men to handle it. And what you did is you waded out at dusk into the water just as it was getting to be in a deep place and you cast out that huge net and then you'd wait. And when you could, you would scoop up all the fish that you could. Well, anything, you didn't discern, you just pulled in anything that got into that net until it was full and it was heavy. And it took a group of men to pull that heavy net from the water with the tide pulling at it onto the dock or onto the shore. And once there, then you would take all the crustaceans and the fish that weren't good and all the other little creatures that didn't belong and you pitch them aside and you put the good fish into baskets to be cleaned and to be sold. And it was a tedious process. Sometimes in either of these cases, you might be out and you would catch nothing. Other days, you'd have a good day and you never really knew. In the morning though, all the nets needed to be mended because if you think about the weight of those fish, there was always a tear in that net. So you had to every day be mending those nets again so you got up early, you started mending, took you all day nearly, and then you started again. So the process of fishing was long, it was hard, it took dedication, it took extreme patience, and it took perseverance. Because some days it looked like you just weren't going to have a good catch. But you had a long view. You knew that if you kept it up every single day that you would get somewhere. And we know that the Zebedee fishing industry did well. Because when James and John are called by Jesus, they leave their father in the boat with the hired men. So for them to be able to hire extra people, they had to be doing a good job, which meant that that family business was made up of extremely hard workers. So who were these guys? They were burly, they were strong, they were muscular men who could handle huge amounts of fish in heavy nets and who had the dedication to get up from morning to night and do the same thing every single day. You couldn't miss a day, you might miss the best catch. You didn't get vacations. You just went out there and you dedicated yourself to that industry. So when Jesus calls his disciples, he's calling a certain kind of person. 
Jesus moved, remember, from Nazareth, which was kind of in the central area, all the way to Capernaum on the coast, on purpose. He wanted to be where the action was. He wanted to be where the people were. But more than that, he wanted to be near certain areas where we see him leaving Israel and going into areas like Jerusalem and Syrophoenicia. Places where there weren't the normal group of Jewish people, but there were people whom he was trying to find. And we get a clue from the Old Testament that tells us that God someday is going to come and send fishers out to find the lost people of Israel. He's going to send fishers, God says. Because lost were all of those people in the Babylonian captivity, in the Assyrian takeover, in the Persian kingdom, all those people who had been displaced and removed from their homes and even their areas, those people after the reign of Pompey who were allowed to return, but returned after hundreds of years, that's generation upon generation of living in a foreign culture around people who worshiped other gods, that had other ways of living and other traditions and habits, they were not remembering who they were. They needed to be reminded of their heritage, of their background, of who they were in the eyes of God, because these people, the Jewish people, were sent to be the light to the other nations the apostles to all the other people who would see the glory of God and who God was. They had forgotten their mission. And so a large portion of Jesus' ministry, his main mission was to find them and bring them home, to cast out that wide net among all the nations and all the people and gather them in so that the ones who knew him would hear him, would become disciples, and he would be able to discern their hearts and sort them out, and he would be able to cleanse them and return them to their ministry and mission of God. Disciples those that Jesus chose, many of them had that part of the fishermen for a reason. Jesus uses the phrase to them, I want to teach you to fish for people. And this phrase is an interesting phrase. It's actually not original to Jesus. It comes from the Greek philosopher Herodotus who wrote it in about 400 B.C as he was describing a dragnet kind of experience that the Persians used when they swept over the Greek islands. This same dragnet approach is what Jesus uses in his ministry. As he gathers thousands of people wherever he preaches, not only in the usual areas, but in the areas where no one else would go. He gathers people, and he knows that some of them are just there to be curious. Some of them are never going to be disciples. They won't get it. They're not interested. Some of them won't remember who they are, but many of them will. And he'll heal them. And he'll teach his apostles to heal them. And he'll remind them who they are and invite them to come home. Jesus talks to everybody in hope that some will return as his disciples. That's the way Jesus' ministry went the entire time. And it's the same thing that he calls us still to do today. 
Because those apostles, those disciples whom he taught, those fishermen, and he, he had disciples with a lot of different types of gifts, but many of them were fishermen. He had disciples who were good at keeping the purse. He had disciples that were good at healing and compassion. He had disciples that were good at preaching. But he also had apostles. And those apostles, if you think about the people who especially were vocal in the early church, they were your fishermen. Because he knew they had the ability to fail and get back up and keep going. They had the ability to know that maybe this town or that town doesn't listen, but the next one might. They had the perseverance to get up and go proclaim the gospel every single day, even though they were persecuted or things might not have worked out the way they hoped. They had the drive to do it again and again and again over years as the early church was built, the church that you have now. And Jesus calls every single congregation to be disciples in that same way. Some of you may be purse holders. Some of you may be preachers. Some of you may be those compassionate healing people. And some of you may be apostles. And so I ask you today to think about who you are in this community in your faith community. Who are you? Because it takes a team. And that's what Jesus knew the most. It takes a team with all those gifts. But a lot of times in our churches we forget about that important job of apostle. You can have all those other folk doing all those other things, but without the apostles, you can't continue to build the church. Who is Jesus calling you to be? Join now in our closing hymn together, How Firm a Foundation.
now and 